Light was in my heart. Light was in my words. Light was in my thoughts. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. With me today on the show, I have my friend Karen Lewis. And we wanted to talk uh, a bit about the dangers of personal narcissism, um, which seems to be all around us, but maybe a complex term that it's difficult for some people to to completely understand right away. But and, and there's so much to say on the subject. Of course, we're going to barely scratch the surface as usual. But um, in my understanding, personal narcissism goes beyond being selfish to a way of looking at and relating to the world that can actually m make it more difficult to see and understand things. Um, it's what I sometimes call the importance of having external points of reference. That when you try to understand something, you know how you understand it. But to consider for a moment how somebody else understands it. And I know how it affects me, but how does it affect him and her and them? And by having those external points of reference, you create a more complete understanding of whatever the thing is you're looking at. Because how it affects each of them is going to affect my relationship with those people. Consequently, our ability to collaborate, our ability to communicate, um, and, and our ability to develop in ourselves. Yes. Um, with personal narcissism, um, the, the, the people that actually have that seem to be very much um, isolated in their, their, own, their own world and... Um, well, and sometimes they don't even realize they are. Quite often. And trying to find a way to reach in and uh, create a wholeness, to create a flow of energy of, um, of shared experiences and, um, as you say, collaborating in order to mm -hmm. build something is uh, rather challenging. Um, one of the witticisms I coined in one of my early newsletters was that life is a collaborative effort. We all take turns being the one in need. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing in reflecting on that afterwards that I noticed is that everyone hates to take their turn. We all want to be on the benevolent side, but we don't want to be the one in need. And um, you know, perhaps that's an evidence of personal narcissism as well. To the hope even that we could be completely self-sufficient, um, you know, in fact we can't. Even if there's no other people around, we're dependent upon plants and animals and things outside of ourselves in order to survive. There's, there's no such thing as total self-sufficiency. And yet it seems to be one of the uh, themes in our culture that uh, is fairly predominant time to time, trying to ask people, trying to um, impel people to be completely self-sufficient. Um, one should be able to be financially self-sufficient, to have well, all of one's needs met pretty much um, in, a, alone or w with only one other person. Um, to well, the, the thing we have to remember about our societies is, the so is that society values different things at different points in time. Indeed. And you know, in one age, uh, the engineers perhaps were the ones valued. In another age, it was the medical professionals. In another age, it was the computer professionals. And whatever society is valuing at this point in time, uh, within the American capitalistic system in any case, probably means that they're going to be paid more than other people. I'm not sure that's fair, because I'm not sure why this person should have to work four hours in order to get one hour of time from this person. When in fact they are so mutually dependent upon each other that if either one doesn't do their job, they'll both perish. I believe there was something you, you were telling me about, um, or, or maybe I read it, I can't remember at this point. There's a place where there are people that are very wealthy and they need needed to have people clean their houses and uh, teach the children and other sorts of um, 
vital lower low paid services mm -hmm. and low paid only because society doesn't value them right. not because their contribution is an essential exactly so although these essential contributions from these people who are not as well remunerated for what they do um, are are needed there they're not given the amount of income that is required in order to live in those communities and in some of those places commuting is a very onerous and expensive proposition not only in time but also in materials and so forth um, so, so it's to everyone's advantage actually to drive the cost of living down rather than raising the rent as high as you can to get the most profit to consider that by creating affordable housing low-cost food etc you are giving people the ability to take care of each other better well as as in uh, any other aspect of human or i guess the physical endeavor um, um extremes um are very damaging debilitating um extremes in weather extremes in temperature extremes in income mm -hmm. uh in some societies too much or too little income is also a bad thing um the, is that it's what you're not saying? so much income, the absolute amount of the income, but it's the relational amount of the income within, for instance, the society. In uh, Japan, they have limits on how much the heads of corporations can have. And mm -hmm. that limit is based on the lowest paid worker within those corporations. And okay. so there is. So they do have capitalism, but it's within bounds that keep it from running amok. It's within bounds that allow people to survive and function at a level which is above absolute need, but without uh, damaging others. Without c conspicuous consumption, as, as well, one person there put it. Well, there's conspicuous consumption, consumption in Japan, but it's not at a level as it can be in other countries and is in other countries where... Um, there is a, a, a s small group that essentially has um, well over half the assets of the society mm. and the decisions on what to do and how things are going to be made um, you know everything laws and so forth are um, the, yeah so I don't know if if anyone else ever said it if you'll find it in writing anywhere but or in print anywhere but it seems to me that one of the responsibilities inherent in having great financial resources is that you are then, uh, by Mother Nature, I guess, put in the position of being responsible for or taking care of those uh, who do not have enough. Once one's income is beyond a certain amount or a certain times of amount that is required, uh, to meet one's uh, needs. Um, once it's beyond a certain point, it becomes relatively pointless. One of the strange things about wealth in particular is that there, no matter how wealthy an individual becomes, it is never enough. Mm -hmm. They always feel well, insecure. Unless. Yeah. Unless. Unless. <laughs> that person fully embraces the role of being society's caretaker. You know, if That's that if the if the wealthy person, you know, the house is paid for, the car is paid for, mm -hmm. college is paid off, there's no debts, okay, now I get to be society's fairy godmother. And I get to go through my community, my neighborhood, my town, my state, mm -hmm. um, or the place I, the village I, I visited in Europe last year on my vacation, wherever, and lo and behold, they need a new hospital. Mm -hmm. They need uh, a new roof on the school. They need um, a reliable automobile that doesn't suck up all the gas that they can possibly put into it. Ah. With my work with uh, people from other countries, um, and having actually worked a great deal on, with um, relief aid and so forth, mm -hmm. um, something that I've, 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 I've come to mostly deeply appreciate is the microloans that have been given. Not much is required. For many people, 
um, that are micro loans being the banking industry's answer to helping it's villages develop. Initially, it was individuals' answers uh, and people with ordinary income um, mm -hmm. from without the, out the society going into a, another country and uh, realizing that very small amounts of money or resources or whatnot is needed in order to help people drastically improve their quality of life. And so this would be like a millionaire making a loan for five thousand dollars to uh, someone who wants to start his own business in another state. No, this is like a, a school teacher going to um, um, Tibet okay. and loaning uh, money of uh, $20 perhaps to a, a, f a woman that's the head of her family and giving her the, and so, so she can make her dreams come true in uh, procuring what she needs in order to say, create crafts, a small home industry, a, a small business. And, and then over time she repays that loan. Okay. And then it is, cr it, it is put back into essentially a pot. And each time that the pot grows, more people can come and make those microloans. And because they're bound by the interconnection of the community, okay. um, they're, they have the incentive to bring, bring back, to repay the loans with, with a small amount of interest. And more and more people are, al are able then to create these loans, uh, sorry, to cr uh, create these uh, small businesses, these small home businesses and feed their families and have a much higher quality of life. Sometimes it doesn't take much. Okay. Um, um, At some yeah. point, obviously, though, the market's going to be saturated to where somebody uh, takes out a small loan and simply isn't able to produce enough or, or get the goods to the right places or something. Everyone has their own way of doing it. It's one of those things that are very fluid. It might not be everyone has their own, you know, um, I don't know, um, fibers. But, but when an individual yeah. is loaning $20 to a woman in Tibet, mm. even if that woman defaults on the loan, it's probably not going to be a major tragedy. Right. Uh, because the, the whole scale of the, the micro loans, as mm -hmm. you call them, mm -hmm. uh, defaulting on a micro loan is not going to put the lender into the um, into financial ruin, right? Because there's not that much on the table. It's not like you've you've extended uh, like you've already extended yourself and put yourself in jeopardy, where you have to have that repaid or else. It's it's keeping the amount small enough and diversified enough that you know they're not all going to default. Um, mm -hmm. But the but in that it seems to me on a spiritual emotional level you can also take pride in knowing that you're helping to make the world a better place using capitalistic principles. I mean, this may be the most uh, virtuous application of capitalistic principles uh, that I've heard all week. And uh, it's something that, that has spread. It's done in many countries now, and there are many different groups that are doing this. And um, So why not here? You know, there there have been some people that have applied the principles to here, and I have heard as much from, of that. Okay. Um, that's not my point of interest so much, um, but I do know that here, or with, or anywhere that one is giving charity, um, it is something that is a short-term solution to something, mm -hmm. and you know the equivalent of you know teaching someone to fish rather than you know giving them a fish you know that difference but because of the hassle of paperwork the regular banking industry is not going to bother with 20 and 30 and 50 and 100 dollar loans right and but that's something that people can do that's something individual people can do and it's admirably su suited to uh, these small communities because these people have that that common bond they um, are all participants, and it affects everyone within that that community. Well, and it also creates the accountability that you you do expect them to pay this back. It is not a gift, and if they default on it, what that means they don't ever get another loan. Um, 
it, it, essentially they would be under a great deal of pressure from the others that are in the group to repay that or to have help for the person that is until they can start doing it or yeah um, well that raises the question of whether the uh, the microloans work in the absence of communal village type relationships I'm wondering if that's why when I haven't uh, no one's brought to my attention the equivalent here in the States mm. because we're such a mobile society and we're if we lose track of the accountability and the integrity then it may be difficult for that solution to work here and yeah so it'd be just like any other loan for say a mortgage or what mm. whatnot um, but when you know the people and they're part of your village so to speak if mm -hmm. not literally then relationally mm -hmm. uh, you know, it might be people within a single church you know yeah, keeping tabs on each other's needs but yeah. this kind of goes back to the you know our our main topic of personal narcissism and the notion that we all take turns being the one in need in this country uh, correct me if I'm wrong but it seems to me we have this uh, adversarial element of a cultural societal discouragement to make your needs known you know so that when you are in need of uh, food clothing shelter money for gas etc it's almost too late well people say hi how are you doing society expects you to say fine yes. even if it's not true I'm, you know, maybe I'm, this is where I'm a revolutionary in a small way, but I'm of the opinion that when somebody asks, how are you doing, you should answer them truthfully. And if you're not doing well, for heaven's sake, say so. How else are they going to know? And if they don't know, they can't do anything about it. <laughs> but that's not our cultural norm. I understand yeah. that. I think it's a cultural norm that needs to be rewritten one person at a time. Well, yes, the more that we're truly interconnected the more honest we are with each other mm -hmm. as individuals and with you know within our interactions with others the more that people can uh, you know allow those energies to flow to you know um, create as as they do in many other of the older cultures and uh, um, to have a, some kind of social net so that people don't become homeless they don't become uh, completely lost. Yeah, we prevent the problem from ever occurring. Right. By being there at the in, at the beginning instead of waiting for it to grow into a big problem at the end. It would be wonderful to be able to meet everyone's needs with the resources we have. You know, one would mm -hmm. think that. Uh, Too that often, be I've difficult. heard people make the comment, "Not my problem." And it I, is. <laughs> and I was going to say, but that's not true. It it is your problem. <laughs> But the, the thing to bear in mind with that, so that we're not approaching it in a naive, ineffective, enabling sort of way, is that there are certain things that people have to do for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yes. But solving the whole problem is not one of them. Uh, Being there for someone, having, um, having the the empathy to share share resources as they're needed to the people that need them at the time that they need them in mm -hmm. the way that's required for the, you know for for that uh, to become actually uh, a self self growth for for all parties involved mm -hmm. I think would be an ideal yeah it should be very much enabled at creating growth. Um, and that it's not always easy to see, to see what would do that, mm -hmm. um, but it's things like, um, well, another one of my witticisms, whoever wants the muscles has to lift the weights. Mm -hmm. You know, the only one who can get you out of bed every morning and get to work is yourself. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, somebody else may provide you with the opportunity so that when you get out of bed on your own, you have something worthwhile to do. There's uh, incentive. It's it, nice. I suspect, I don't know if there's any way to verify it, but I suspect the reason s many people, maybe not all of them, are so 
uh, enamored of retirement mm -hmm. uh, from their professional careers is because most of the people in this country are doing jobs that aren't right for them. You know, people who are doing what they love don't ever want to quit. Mm -hmm. I, again, going with the fact that every person has something different to contribute. And uh, standardi standardizing jobs, you know, um, what is done in those work isn't at all the way to uh, bring those out within people. There needs to be enough leeway in there that m people's individual skills, talents, um, uh, the beauty can shine through. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but this create is not about being narcissistic. Mm -hmm. This is about being an individual who can contribute to that individual's relationships. And if a person is narcissistic, they're less likely to uh, contribute to the needs of others. They'll put themselves the only in the center. Um, the entire world can be eaten, and uh, there's, they might still not, might not be satisfied. Um, the, the old tales of the fisherman and his wife and so forth. Um, um, the fisherman and his wife? Yes. Um, the fisherman, uh, there, there are many, many different variations of it. Um, all over the world, but essentially it's a fisherman um, finds a magic charm or is given three wishes mm -hmm. and, or, or, or given some wishes and, or uh, incurs a debt by a magical being and the magical being or you know uh, cr creates um, whatever the fisherman wants, gives him everything that he asks for and as time progresses the fisherman's asking for more and more and more, and the wife is finally saying, this can't go on. <laughs> mm -hmm. And everything at the end, of course, implodes, and okay. they're back to where they begin, just like people winning the lottery. You know? <laughs> um, without... without um, if you can't answer the word enough. The nurse. Mm -hmm. But that's why, uh, in a earlier conversation, I mentioned how the only way I could see that it's not a problem for someone to develop higher and higher incomes mm -hmm. is if they invest themselves in using all of their excess for the betterment of everyone in their community. That's why uh, one of the things that were developed was, you know, the tax breaks for uh, charitable contributions. Mm -hmm. um, that was the original idea. That was, yeah. It, it seems to have gone a bit awry, of course. <laughs> well. <laughs> But again, if we could get back to that, you know, the reason we give tax breaks for this is because this is, this is what creates strong, healthy communities. And strong, healthy communities are not empowered by personal narcissism, you know, by a, by a disconnect, by a, a disregard, by an apathy. Um, I, I once suggested to someone that there should be a Twilight Zone episode uh, you know, that TV show about altered realities and such. Yes. Uh, in which a person who is personally very narcissistic mm -hmm. makes a negative comment about working class people mm -hmm. and wakes up the next morning to find that all of the working class people are gone. No waitresses, no cooks, no gas station attendants, no janitors. Um, I mean, the world would come to a screeching halt because it takes everyone to make it run. It does indeed. And it also takes, again, more than humans to make it run. Um, mm -hmm. Humans tend to be narcissistic around themselves. There are other uh, forms of life that are required for us to have our lives, and we need to become more aware and loving of them as well, so that we don't become not only uh, narcissistic as um, a, a society um, or, uh, or as a species, Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, I hesitate to bring up a whole new angle of discussion this late in the show because we haven't got that many, we're almost out of time, but I, um, the subject that occurs to me at this point is the relationship people have with their dogs. Mm -hmm. And for me, my dogs are four-footed furry members of my family. Mm -hmm. And I talk to them as if they were people and we interact as people and they they behave about as well as three-year-olds, you know, <laughs> kind of, sort of there, but not perfectly. Um, but I'm saddened sometimes when I see people acquiring dogs and objectifying them, treating them like objects. 
they want dogs for security. So they tie them up in the yard and the dog is never socialized, never, uh, no interaction, no playtime, no respect, no validation. Um, these are generally very unhappy dogs. And uh, I mean, I've heard some people, very few people, but I have heard some people talk about having pets as being a form of enslavement of another species. I don't know that I would go that far because as much as I am giving to my dogs every day, they are giving so much to me in terms of psychological and emotional health and all sorts of other things. And, you know, I, I do my best to really respect it as a multi-species family, not as this is the dog that I own, as if it's an object that I manipulate, but to understand that the dog has needs just as I have needs, and hopefully we're able to craft a relationship that is symbiotic, in which each of us provides for the other what the other cannot provide for himself. Yes. Um, which, of course, is the opposite of narcissism. Exactly. Because yes. it's all about relationship. And everyone benefits. Every creature benefits. Mm -hmm. I, I provide the food cl or the food and shelter that my dogs need, and they provide the companionship and the emotional and psychological health that I need. And, you know, when we bring love to whatever we do, to whatever relationships we have um, with each other or across species, um, it becomes a win-win situation. Yes. But it's definitely not personal narcissism. <laughs>